Our reading this morning is from Revelations 21, starting at verse 1. And as Barry said, it's on page 1769 in your pew Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm not bringing this stool to stand on. Uh, what do you expect never to break? Uh, this stool has been in our bathroom for uh, as long as I can remember. And before that, it was in my dad's bathroom as he grew up, in the house that he grew up. Now, you can see it's, it's lost, lost something here, but uh, it, it's still looking pretty good for its age, isn't it? Uh, there, there are, are there items in your house like this that you just expect not to break? Uh, that you just expect to keep on going. Um, uh, just by the way, we thought of wooden spoon too, just for those who thought of wooden spoon. Yeah, we, 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 we came up with that too. Uh, I mean, there's some things in your house you just expect never to break. Like your, have you got a go-to hammer that you've had for years? Uh, maybe you know that screwdriver set that came from your parents' house that you've still got? Um, or that mix master in the kitchen that uh, you just can't remember seeing the last mix master? No, they've broken? Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, there's some you expect to, things you expect to go, get, go obsolete, uh, become obsolete very quickly. Um, so phones, you don't expect them to be around for long, do you? And the, the dishcloths and those paper masks that we wore for a while, they don't last for long, do they? Uh, we expect our cars and our dishwashers to, to not be around forever. It annoys us when they break, but we think, wow, it's been around for a while. Um, and, and so as we think about these things, we do expect some things to be ongoing and we expect some things uh, to become obsolete. It's interesting when we think about that issue, uh, which category do you include yourself in? See, I assume that I'm ongoing, aren't I? I, I, I don't know whether you do the same. We, we assume, I think, that uh, we're going to be there to see the next phone, the next dishwasher, the next car. Um, that is, uh, that's actually a bit of a myth, isn't it? We might not be around to see the next phone or dishwasher or car. Uh, the, where the Bible and indeed our experience reminds us that we are anything but ongoing. Uh, Psalm 90, teach us to number our days, that we may go, gain a heart of wisdom. This week I've mourned with others at, at Greg's funeral, at Christopher's funeral, at Mark's funeral. And yet I still forget that there's a 100% chance that one day it will be mine, unless Jesus returns. And so you see, we naturally buy into this myth that we're part of the group of things that are ongoing forever despite all the evidence. We buy into the myth that everything is ongoing, including ourselves. Uh, friends, as we finish up this Making Christ Known series, I want to leave you with this final motivation for making Christ known. Uh, and, and, and here it is. Making Christ known is not ongoing, but temporary and therefore urgent. Making Christ known is not ongoing, but temporary and therefore urgent. Two ways. Firstly, personally. Uh, because we're not ongoing, neither will our efforts to make Christ known but become, be ongoing. Uh, one day, those efforts will cease. 
Uh, and secondly, and more broadly, the age that we're living in is not ongoing. Uh, Jesus will return and bring about a new age where Christ will be known one way or the other. So let me t- just take both of those in turn. Firstly, personally, our efforts in making Christ known are not ongoing, but temporary. Uh, as we've discussed over the last couple of weeks, uh, one of the hardest things in making Christ known is crossing the pain line. Uh, uh, we need constant motivation to cross that pain line, willingly taking on the difficult conversations, uh, willingly taking on the consequences of those conversations. Uh, We've seen the pain line two weeks ago in 1 Peter uh, and Philippians last week. We could have equally turned to 2 Corinthians 4, which is a passage I'm just going to ask you to turn to now. I know Judah didn't read this passage, but I'd like to have a look at this passage too. 2 Corinthians 4 is an equally, uh, it's it's a pain line passage where we see of the pain of making Christ known. If you have a look at 2 Corinthians 4, uh, it's on page 1646. um, And in fact, uh, 1647, uh, we'll start at verse 7. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. You can hear the pain line here. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. You can hear of the the apostles' experience of crossing the pain line there, can't you? The apostle says, we believe in the resurrection of Jesus, and therefore we speak, wanting this treasure, this grace of God, to reach more people. And the implications for him are around our expectations of ongoing versus obsolete. Look at it with me, verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Verse 18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal there's so much there but briefly uh, there is an obsolescence to the struggle of making Christ known because of our own obsolescence Uh, we are wasting away in Paul's words Depending on our age, we experience this at a different pace. They say it's all downhill from age 30. I don't know whether, whether that's true for you. Uh, but there's a mind-bending truth here to, to, to wrestle with. Everything we see is temporary. You could say everything we see is obsolete. Everything we see is temporary. Verse 18. Uh, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary. The mind-bending perspective here is that everything you can see is temporary. But what do you see as you look around you? Well, you see people, don't you? There isn't a person here who isn't temporary. We are all temporary. You know, having been to three funerals this week, I'm reminded that none of us will be here in 100 years. 100 years, none of your family and friends will be here either. Now, there's an unseen reality in in God's people that's ongoing. Uh, We're being renewed inwardly day by day, but you can't see that. Everything we see is temporary. And I suspect in the context of 2 Corinthians, the apostle is speaking about the pain that results from crossing that pain line, from making Christ known, the imprisonments, the beatings, the, the abuse. They're all temporary. They'll come to an end. I think he calls it our light and momentary troubles. I mistakenly presume that everything will keep on going in my life just as it has been going without end, despite all the evidence. I make decisions on what to buy for the future. Uh, I make plans on where I will go in the future. I fill my diary all on the assumption that I'm going to be there, despite all the evidence. We all do it. Now, I suspect there's a sense in which we need to do that just in terms of function as humans. 
But I suspect that's what the book of James is getting at when he says this. Uh, Now listen, this is James 4, now listen you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this uh, or that city, spend a year there, carry on business there, make money. Why do you not even know? Uh, Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. It's the same kind of truth, isn't it? Both James and Paul are reminding us that we are not in the ongoing category. When we are wise, we will realise that our time is short. We spoke before about the items that uh, we expect to be obsolete, you know, dishcloths, face masks, uh, in-time cars and dishwashers. But more controversially, uh, some things have an obsolescence that is planned by the manufacturer. Now, manufacturers deny this, right? They say, oh, no, no, we'd we'd never build uh, products that would only last a certain amount of time. Uh, But uh, back in 2017, Apple was accused of slowing down their older iPhones to speed up the uptake of the newer iPhones. That's, That's pretty believable, isn't it? Big tech companies wouldn't do that, would they? And same with us, friends. When we look at the evidence, we're not all that different to those goods that have a planned obsolescence, are we? Our time here on earth is limited. And so that's the first point. For us personally, making Christ known is a temporary opportunity. We and all those around us in this seen form are not part of the ongoing. And therefore, this is an urgent opportunity to make Christ known. That's the first point to make. Uh, Secondly, more broadly, uh, the age that we live in is not in the ongoing category either. Uh, Jesus will return and he will bring about a new age where Christ will be known one way or another. Uh, Back in 2 Corinthians 4, we heard what is seen, uh, what is unseen is eternal. Uh, Have a look with me again at that, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 4.16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So we've thought through this, seen is temporary. Now we turn to thinking about what is unseen is eternal. What is unseen? Well, in this passage, it's the glory, uh, the glory that outweighs the burden of crossing that pain line again and again. Last week in Philippians, we saw, uh, we spent time with considering the, the cost of making Christ known together the relational cost, the financial cost, the the suffering. And and Paul is torn between dying to be with Jesus, which is better, versus living to serve the church now, which is needed. He's he's torn. But he says the false teachers are not torn. Uh, He says the false teacher, uh, false teachers set their mind on earthly things. And he says, you should be different to that. He says, uh, uh, Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. See, we await the return of Jesus. We await the saviour from heaven. At his return, this age will pass away. The new age will begin. As our reading this morning put it, the old order of things has passed away. That time will come. And therefore, that should determine our priorities now. Uh, This is what Jesus calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't he? To invest in the unseen eternal rather than the seen now. Uh, You remember Matthew 6, 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where uh, moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. 
I'm sorry, there your heart will be also. When we look at the picture of heaven, we see what endures. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. I, I wonder if this has been bugging you since you first heard it. How do you fix your eyes on what is unseen? Did that strike you? How do you fix your eyes on what is unseen? It's a bit like saying, here, come smell this uh, um, uh, aromaless, uh, aromaless poison. Think, okay, but how? How am I meant to fix my gaze on what I can't see? Well, there are so many word pictures in the Bible of the unseen picture of heaven. And uh, the passage that, that Judith read for us does a masterful job of describing that unseen reality. And fundamentally, it is a glorious relational reality uh, of God with his people. Uh, turn with me in your Bible there to Revelation 21, verse 3. Revelation 21, verse 3. Uh, Judith read that for us earlier. Revelation 21, verse 3. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is living the dream for God's people. God did dwell with his Old Testament people, but that was fraught with difficulty. It's not, it wasn't like this. Now, of course, it wasn't just the hope of the Old Testament believers. This letter, Revelation, was written to a suffering church. People were suffering, their property being taken off them, those who were being marginalised for following Jesus, those who were crossing the pain line. It was not just a figure of speech. They were actually in pain. To, the, to them, this was living the dream of God's unseen glory. And, and this is the relational reality, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Now, we're not sure precisely when this will happen. Perhaps today. But we know that at Jesus' return, this is going to happen. Everything will be made new. It's a new relationship between God and his people, a, a marriage indicating new intimacy, a relationship that protects us from death and mourning and crying and pain. This relationship is that which we look forward to. This is the eternal picture. This is the eternal ongoing of the two categories, obsolete and ongoing. This is most certainly the eternally ongoing picture. Uh, for our purposes today in, in bringing this Making Christ Known series to an end, uh, please do notice that this is the moment when Making Christ Known is over. When we fall before the throne of God, when we are united with him in heaven, making Christ known as an activity will cease. Uh, John Piper, the American preacher, puts it this way, when this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. The sad reality for us is that this picture is not yet complete. Of course, while God's people are in, it's very clear that there are some who are out. Did you see verse 8? It starts with a but. It's connected. It's a connected thought. Verse 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. It sticks out a bit in a passage like this, doesn't it? In a passage that's full of the hope of eternity. This little verse is like a pebble in the shoe. You know, it's, it's just a reminder of the real world of heaven. Those who trust Jesus are in, but those who don't are out. Off the bat, this, this list feels a bit judgy, a bit judgmental. Notice the second on the list there. 
unbelievers. I know unbelievers as you do, and I love them. I know people who fit the other descriptions too, and I love them too. It sounds judgy until we remember that without the grace of God in our life, we belong on that list too. That is left to our own devices. Without the changing work, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we're on that list too. There's a similar list in 1 Corinthians 8. And after that similar list, the apostle says this, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's only God's kindness that we're not on that list. It's only by God's kindness that we belong in that ongoing eternal picture of God's kingdom in Christ. Friends, have you heard the phrase disaster fatigue? Disaster fatigue. For example, in Australia, uh, between late 2019 and late 2021, we had years of regional drought. Then it was followed by the black summer bushfire and then various flooding events. Do you remember that? Uh, when this kind of wave of disasters hit communities, it's really hard for authorities to cut through with warnings about a coming disaster. People, pe people just hear the warnings and just think, man, I'm still coping with this current disaster. I, I don't have enough emotional energy to start thinking about a disaster that's yet to hit. You can totally understand the authorities pulling their hair out over this, can't you? But you can also totally understand the people. Their, their perspective as they're struggling with one disaster after another, just trying to make it through to the next day. Well, friends, I wonder if sometimes we're in the same category there. That we know that everything we see is temporary. That we know that this age is going to end, that we know that Jesus is going to return. But sometimes we just get a bit fatigued by thinking about the reality of what that means for the people we love around us. But friends, of course, this is just an urgent call, isn't it? To make Christ known, to seek to see people we love no longer on that list that we were once on, but brought into that renewed relationship with God. At Christ's return, this division between those who are in and those who are out is going to be permanent. We can have decision fatigue about this. We can think, oh man, I can't really deal with thinking about that level of disaster. I, I just do nothing. But of course, that is so costly. We have this news that sees people go from death to life in Jesus. We make Christ known in an obsolete world. That is so powerful. So friends, let me, let me summarise. Uh, firstly, personally, because we are not ongoing, neither will our efforts to make Christ known be ongoing. Our efforts to make Christ known will cease one day, personally. Uh, and secondly, more broadly, uh, the age that we live in is not ongoing. We have this glorious picture of glory in Revelation, brought about by the return of Jesus. Jesus. This new age of relationship with God, oneness with God, an age where there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. In a world that is ongoing, not obsolete, eternal. Thank God what a joy that will be. However, despite that joyful prospect, there will be no more making Christ known. Because that division between those who trust Jesus and those who don't is now made permanent. So we make Christ known because making Christ known is actually not ongoing. 
There's an obsolescence to making Christ known. So we keep making Christ known until that day of Jesus' return. We need God's help with this, don't we? Let me pray. The psalmist says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, as we recognise something of what you've planned for us, we are amazed and excited. We know how easily uh, we get distracted by what we see here. Uh, So please help us to have our eyes fixed on this future ongoing reality in your Son. And by your Spirit, please motivate us to make Christ known in this temporary and urgent situation that we're in. We ask this not for ourselves, but we ask this for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.